Uh, while our children are leaving, um, turn in your Bible to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to continue on what we started last week. Last week we were in Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Talked about the things that bind us together. Talked about not wasting our life. What binds us together? It's the gospel message of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So it binds us together. It's not race it's not gender i told jenny it's definitely not geography because she's from california and we're not we're from texas so that's not what binds us together it's the gospel message of jesus is what binds us together you go down to um, verse 10 and, and paul says i want you to really understand what matters so that you'll live pure and blameless lives paul's just telling the, the people the church in philippi it's all the people he's telling them hey listen don't waste your life live for what matters you know don't don't mess up on living your life for the things that the world tells for you to live, live for the things that actually matter, okay? So this gets us to verse 12, that's where we're gonna be, verse 12 uh, through verse 19. All right, y'all find it? Yep. Everybody say yeehaw if you found it. Yeehaw. All right, here we go, verse 12, let's read through the whole thing. And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, listen to this, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. It's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know that I have been appointed to defend the good news. Those others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely intending to make my change more painful for me. But that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached. And either way, so I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice for I know that as you pray for me and the spirit of Jesus helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. Okay, man, this is some good stuff. All right, I told y'all to buckle up last week and some of y'all didn't. This week, everybody needs to buckle up because this is some good stuff right here, okay? Let's go ahead and look at it from starting in verse 12. No, no, I, I actually titled this message two weeks in a row, two titles, two weeks in a row. This is big time, okay? This message uh, this week is titled, or entitled, uh, Bite the Bullet. How many of y'all have ever heard that saying, bite the bullet? Yeah? Anybody ever bit the bullet on anything? You might not know the origin of this phrase, but bite the bullet. Um, it's probably not surprising to you that it is a military term. It's, it's something that whenever a soldier would be injured on a battlefield, uh, before they would actually have casings and stuff like that, they would say, bite the leather, but now they say, bite the bullet. And they would say before that there was actually any kind of anesthetic that they could uh, administer to somebody who was injured in the field, in battle, uh, they would actually take a bullet and they would say, hey, bite down on this. This sounds fun, right? Anybody ever bit down on, on a piece of metal? That's not fun. I've knocked my whole front teeth out. They're all fake. That's anything that when it just comes to hurting your teeth, it just hurts me. I don't, I don't even like to think about it. So bite the bullet. And basically it was for two different reasons. One reason was because they would say bite the bullet because it's going to take your mind off even for just a little bit about the pain that's taking place and kind of take your mind to a different area, a different place. And the other one was this. They didn't want to cause any more further harm. They didn't want to hurt you any further by say, you know, biting your tongue off. That doesn't sound like a good thing to do either. So they say bite the bullet. But what it turned into was it was kind of almost a badge of honor whenever you would walk around and people would either know that guy bit the bullet or you could tell other people, hey, I bit the bullet. And this was a way to tell other people, hey, I made it through a really, really hard and injured time in my life. I made it through that and I bit the bullet and I'm here now. Okay, so this is kind of, you can probably see where we're going with this, is that we need to learn how to bite the bullet. Everybody say it, bite the bullet. Okay, we're going to learn how to bite the bullet. Every single one of us, none of us in this room are exempt from trials. Y'all know this to be true, right? Everybody in this room had trials. Anybody in this room ever had hard times, lost a loved one, lost somebody that meant something to you, went through a time, that, a season that you would have chosen to go through on your own? Anybody? Okay, none of us are exempt from that. So we've got to learn how to bite the bullet. Okay, verse 12, Paul says, I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped spread the good news. Okay. 
for us to understand what this is talking about, I want you to know that everything that's happened to me, what has happened to Paul? We have to know this. Paul right here, as he's writing this letter, Paul is in a Roman prison, most likely a Roman prison. There's other thoughts. Most theologians believe that Paul was in a Roman prison, his first Roman imprisonment. And I'm just going to go ahead and go out on the limb and tell you this, that Roman prisons in first century were probably much different than they are today, right? Anybody think that prison is different back with the Romans than it is right now? I don't know if y'all know this or not. In Jacksboro, uh, we have the uh, prison out here. It's what's called a cool bed facility, correct? Cool bed facility, okay? It's a cool bed facility. That means that uh, our prison stays at no warmer than 80 degrees. So if it's, it's, it's 79 or under, okay? Some of y'all keep y'all's house like a, like, a, like a prison that's not a cool bed facility. Brittany, if it was up to her, it'd be like 85 in our house. But we operate a cool bed facility in our household as well. But it's like, okay, so prison's probably much different. Um, you're probably not going to get all your meals every single day. Probably no cable. Um, Toby, we, we go out there, they, they play basketball. Like, I mean, I, it's been a while since I've played basketball. Okay, so they probably weren't, weren't getting to do those things. Like prison is probably completely different in first century Roman prison than it is with what we understand right now. And so Paul, as he's speaking this, this is the context. Paul's going, okay, um, okay, where's my verse? It says, I want you to know that the things that have happened to me, they've actually helped spread the gospel. Like that this is actually a good thing. Like, like we look at these things and we go, man, that is a huge inconvenience. Like I wouldn't want to go to prison. Paul goes, listen, um, which Paul probably doesn't either. But he goes, I want you to know that everything that's happened to me, even the things that we look at and we go, man, these things are inconveniences. Paul goes, it's okay because the gospel is being spread since I've gone through these tough situations. Okay, here's the question. How many of y'all like to go through tough extended period of time situations anybody like to be okay jack you are the only person in this room you're lying <laughs> we need to hang around jack a little bit more because he can like take our hard situations and he can bear them for ashley's like no we're not doing that okay nobody in this room goes i want to be in a hard situation for an extended period of time nobody says that I don't, think, I don't think anybody's arguing with me on that. I know for a fact, our family, like, we're like, the less the better. Like, right, that's good. So here's the question. How many of you would be okay with going through a hard situation for an extended period of time if people came to know Jesus Christ? Huh. Talking to my brothers and sisters in the room right here, okay? You don't know if Jesus Christ isn't your Lord and Savior? That's okay. You're more than welcome in here right now. But I'm talking to the people who would say, Jesus Christ, save me. Okay. How many of y'all are okay with going through a hard time for a long time if other people can come to know Jesus? Because here's what I think pretty much happens, okay? If you will, let me just kind of break down a normal Sunday for a lot of us. We pull into the parking lot. We drive, and if you're here late, uh, Megan's not here today. She's working, but if it was Megan, she's always late. My sister, she's late everywhere she goes. <laughs> And she's always like, I didn't have anywhere to park. I parked in the street. And I'm like, get here earlier. That's how you don't have to park in the street. Just get here sooner, okay? So we get here, and we want a really good parking spot. We walk into the church. We walk up to the doors. You're greeted by Curtis Bryant, who has a smile on his face. He's wearing his Hawaiian shirt, right? He, he says hello to you. He says good morning. You want to be greeted, but you don't want to be greeted too much, right? You don't want overly friendly. You, you don't want Brad Bennett friendly. You just want, you just want someone to smile at you. <laughs> Right? Because, it, because, because if, you, if you come and no one actually says hi to you, then you're going to complain that those people there don't love people and they don't like people, whatever it is. But if they talk too much, you're like, I just want to go into church and I don't want to have to be bothered. So y'all know what I'm talking about. So, so you want to find your parking spot. You want it to be pretty close. You, don't want, you, you, you want to find a minivan to park next to you. That way your door doesn't get dinged. Right? Like we all know the drill. No one has to say hi to you as you walk in. You want to come in and you want to get your free coffee, but you want it to taste just like Starbucks, Lance. I know you do. You're like, I want two shots of this, I want a skinny, I want an extra pump of that, easy on the foam, like, it's like, come on, this is, like, it's free coffee, and it's, it's great, but it's like, if the taste is a little bit off, you're like, my coffee was disgusting this morning, it's like, your free cup of coffee. So then you're like, okay, now I'm going to go check my kids into the children's ministry because I want a children's ministry that's going to preach and teach into my children. And I also just want an hour of my life where I don't have to take care of my kids. So I'm going to go check them in. That's what I really want. 
Amen. <laughs> I'm going to go check my kid in. But then there's a line. And it's like, they're putting labels. There's only 50 kids back there. We know whose kids are whose. But it's like, if we lost your kid, you'd be like, where was the label, right? So it's like, what are we supposed to do? You want the worship service to be no less than three songs of the songs that you want to hear. It better be songs that you know. No more than four songs, for sure. Meaning that we better average out to 23 minutes for the next six months, right, on our, on our worship set. It's got to be 23 minutes, no more, no less. The preacher better understand that the Cowboys have a kickoff time at 12.05. Better be aware of that. You better not preach for more than 33 minutes. Okay, that's all he gets. The AC better be on the exact perfect temperature. Right now it's at 70. And 70, I feel like that's pretty good. But if it's not at the right temperature, let it be known that no less than three to five people will let me know at the end of the service that it was a little warm in here or it's a little cold in here. This is what we want. Church, we don't want to be inconvenienced. Look at what Paul says. He goes, I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that, that my coffee was cold this morning, but it's helped spread the gospel. It's okay. That's not what Paul's saying. He goes, listen, I want you to know that even though I was thrown in prison for the sake of the gospel, this is a good thing. People are hearing about Jesus. Lives are changing. The gospel of Jesus is setting people free. It, this is, guys, this is okay to be inconvenienced for the sake of the gospel. And this is what, this is what Paul is saying. And, and Paul goes, okay, this is a conversation that he has with God. God tells Paul, he goes, hey, you're going to end up going into prison. And Paul's like, ah, oh, man, that just doesn't sound fun. God, how long am I going to be there? And God's having this conversation with him. And he's like, yeah, about two years. And Paul's like, gosh, almighty, okay, two years. Okay, what's it going to look like? And he's like, well, you're going to be chained to a prison guard for the next two years. And he's like, okay, how many prison guards is that? And he goes, well, it's probably going to be a, around two to four prison guards over the next, you know, roughly 700 days. So if you figured the math, it's like you're going to be around, you know, 1,500 to 3,000 prison guards over the next two years. They're going to be chained to you. Paul goes, okay, can they do anything to me? And they go, no, not really. They can beat you. They can, they can kind of, they can, but they can't actually kill you. They can just tell you to, to be quiet. And Paul's like, okay. So that means that I'm going to be around 3,000 prison guards over the next two years. They're chained to me. I can tell them why I'm in prison. I was like, yeah. Paul's like, okay, cool. Sign me up. None of us in here are taking that gig. <laughs> Nobody is. I mean, I'm not. I mean, like, it's like, I'm very privileged to come in here. This is my job. I come into work, and I, again, I, I make my coffee. I sit down in my air-conditioned office, but God's like, oh, I need you to go into prison for the next two years. I'm like, I'm going to talk to Brittany. I'm going to be like, I heard this, but I don't think this is the Lord. And she's like, this is definitely not the Lord. You don't need to do that, right? This is crazy. We don't understand what Paul what Paul is saying. That's why I say we have to understand the context of what's going on with, with Paul, okay? People... Here's what we have to understand is that people are watching you and the people were wanting to know, hey, how is Paul going to respond to this? The church in Philippi that he's writing, he's actually going, hey, I know y'all been wondering like if this thing is real. I know y'all been wondering like, is, is he, is he, is he a phony? Like, does he really believe this stuff? And Paul goes, hey, I know you've been wondering. I know y'all have given gifts to me and to my ministry and, and y'all are wondering right now, am I going to keep doing this? And Paul goes, yes. Even in prison, I'm going to continue to share the gospel. This is what Paul is telling the people. There's people that are watching Paul, and there's people that are watching the people that are here in this room as well. The people that say that they've been through struggles, which was every single one of us. If you claim to be a Christian, the world that's around you is looking at you going, okay, how, how is he going to respond to this? How is he going to respond to that diagnosis? How is he going to respond to the fact that his financial crisis is going on? How is he going to respond to the fact that his marriage is struggling right now? How is he going to respond? People are watching the way that we are going to respond. Okay, here's, here's the question that I have, though. When was the last time that you went through something and you just thought to yourself, man, I'm so glad that I'm going through this? <laughs> I'm going to try to hammer this point in. Like, I mean, we are going to dig in deep on this. It's like, <coughs> probably never. When was the last time that you're like, man, I'm, 
just right now, I'm so glad that my kids are crazy. I'm, I'm so glad that I have a teenage daughter right now. She's just, she's just a joy to have, right? I don't have that. I'm just, I'm just throwing hypotheticals out there. If that's you, then we know, we know, we know, we know, we know, we know, we know. Okay. When was the last time that you're like, man, I'm glad that I lost my job. Man, I'm so glad that my marriage is struggling right now. I'm so glad for that. I'm so glad that I'm in a season of, uh, that I've just been going through depression. And I'm so glad that I've, for the last 12 years, I've been anxious about everything. I'm so glad that my finances are a joke right now. When, when, when was the last time that we're like, man, I'm so glad that this is the case for me? Probably never, and that's okay, okay? But here, here's, the un, here's, here's the thing that we have to understand. Why would we be glad for it? That's first of all, that, like, that makes sense. But you've heard this before probably your test becomes your testimony we talk about testimony a lot let's talk about that a little bit how you respond matters in situations okay students hear me out on this okay how you respond matters that will save you so much trouble in life just understanding this one thing respond the way that you should respond don't respond the way that you want to respond okay Brittany and I uh, Brittany want you come up here and I need to use you for an illustration. I'm just playing. Just, just, it's fine. Just sit down. I don't want to be in trouble with it. So, uh, Brittany and I had been married. I, I'll never forget this. We've been married for about five years at this time. And we were having a conversation. We didn't have kids at that time. Cora, you weren't even born. Cora, you want to raise your hand? Wave to everybody. This is my oldest daughter. Uh, she's very sweet. She just turned eight years old this week. Okay. Yeah. My middle child turned six. It was an expensive week in our household uh, this week. And so, um, so Corey, you weren't even born, and your mom and I, we were having a passionate discussion. You, you've seen a few of those, I think, probably. That's just, we were just having a passionate discussion with each other. Uh, but this is before Corey was born. And Brittany doesn't get passionate about discussion. She's very cool, calm, and collected. On the other hand, I'm, and I'm like, never mind, doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> So we're having this conversation. I don't even remember what it's about. And I just remember, I'll never forget, in the middle of that conversation, Brittany stops me and she goes, hey, <laughs> why don't we just take a break for a second? And I'm like, no, I like to finish this conversation. I like to finish the conversations now. I like to get my points across. I like to know where we're at. And Brittany goes, okay, well then if we're gonna continue, she said, why don't we just make sure that we respond nicely? Because she said, I don't want us to remember in five years how we responded tonight. Okay, that made me even matter. If I'm, if I'm just like, whatever, I'm going to tell you what I still think. Okay, I have since grown in the spirit, uh, the, the fruit of the spirit, so I'm, I'm, I'm a lot better now. Okay, what I mean by that is this, is that you know, she had a great point. Do not regret the way that you respond in five years. Don't say something today that in five years you're gonna be like, I really wish that I wouldn't have said those words to her. Yes. The way that we respond is very important. Fellas, your wife walks in the room, she goes, hey, what do you think about this outfit? And you go, I love it. And she goes, but you paused. <laughs> you're like, I just said that I love it. Yeah, but you paused. You, you, you pause before you responded. The way you respond is very important. Uh, when Brittany and I, uh, I told her before, Cora, before you were even born, I was in Amarillo when I found out that you were, uh, that you were in your mother's tummy, okay? And so I told Brittany, I said, I don't want to be face to face when you tell me that you're pregnant. <laughs> I know this is weird and y'all are like, I, dude, you have so many issues, I do. But I was like, <laughs> I don't know how I'm gonna respond. So it wasn't even by phone call, I just said, I know this is weird, would you please text me? whenever you find out that you're pregnant. I get a text message, I'm cruising down the interstate in Amarillo, it's like, I'm pregnant, and I was like, and I responded very well. I made a phone call back, I mean, it was the greatest, greatest text message of my life hearing that Cora was coming into this world. I know, I'm so messed up, I'm so sorry. But, that just goes to show you, the way that we respond is crucial. You cannot take the way that you respond back, and so this is, what I want us to understand today is that the test that we go to, make sure that we respond well, make sure that we respond the way that we're proud of, that we, after we respond. And by, by the way, listen to this, the test that we go through in our life, the tests that build our testimony, those are the things that actually draw us closer to the Lord, by the way. When we go through our tests, they draw us closer to the Lord. And, and here's another thing that I wrote down that I, that I was thinking about. We never get to choose the test that we go through. We only get to choose our response. I've never heard God tell me or ask me, or I've never felt like I've had any, any 
uh, any any voice in the in the game of God saying, okay, uh, Norval, which one do you want? Do you want financial troubles or do you want your kids to be crazy? Like it's your choice. Like God never gives us choice, but we do have the choice of how we're going to respond. Correct? Amen. Amen. Okay. So that's the first part of verse 12. The second part of verse 12 is it actually says this. It says, everything that has happened to, to you has helped spread the good news. Okay. I want you to think just for a moment. I don't want to try to bring up bad memories. I want to be sensitive to that. But think for a moment. Think about all the things that have happened to you in your life. It's maybe the top five in your life that you're like, man, these are just, these are some of the roughest moments that I've been in in my life. And Paul says when he's talking about him being in prison, he goes, everything that's happened to me has helped spread the good news, okay? It's perspective. It, it brings to mind Romans chapter eight, verse 28, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose for them, okay? Let me tell you what this verse doesn't mean. You become a follower of Jesus and your life looks awesome. It's always great. There's never any struggles. There's never trouble, okay? That's not what that means. It means that in all things, that God can take everything that has happened to you and he can work them for the good meaning that he can use it for the good news of Jesus Christ to be shared and to be heard, okay? And he says that this, everything that's happened to me, has helped spread the good news, okay? So this is out of the NLT. I love preaching out of the NLT, but sometimes they get words very wrong. And this word helped right here is one of those, one of those instances where I need to be able to tell you guys, hey, this is, this is the wrong word to be used right here. The word should be actually helped. It's literally translated as but uh, help should actually be translated as progress, okay? Everything that has happened to me has helped progress the good news, okay? It means to move forward. That's what it means. It means to make a way. It's a military term, and this is what it looks like. It means that whenever um, a military um, uh, a, a unit would try to move into a territory, uh, there would be obstacles that were in the way, and they would have to go in, this would be progress, the one would have to go in and they'd have to move all the obstacles out of the way. That way the army could actually move in and conquer a territory. Okay? So the way that we understand this, as we look at this, just imagine that you need to get to Bryson from Jacksboro. And there's no road. How, how are we going to get there? There's trees everywhere. There's creeks. There's boulders. There's mountains. What do you do? Progress. You've got to make a way. You gotta cut a road. We get the dozers out there, we just start pushing a road. Or I guess, start pushing the road, right? Start pushing. Trees in the way, move it out of the way. Rocks in the way, move it out of the way. Creeks in the way, pushing dirt in it. That way we can keep on driving, and keep on moving forward. This is what this verse means. We sing a song called Waymaker. Y'all know that song? Yeah. And we're familiar with that term. We talk about God, we're like, he's the way maker. Uh, Stephen could probably sing it better than I can. But just for fun, we'll probably have Justin, the youth pastor, come up here and sing it, just to embarrass him. <laughs> but we call God the Waymaker, and it's like, do we really understand what that actually means, though? If God's going to be the Waymaker, there has to be an obstacle in the way for him to make a way. And we look at our life, and every single, thank you, Karen, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> every single one of us, we, this is what we want. We want a life without inconvenience. We want a life that has a road going to wherever we want to go with zero obstacles in it. Guess what? God's not the way maker when that happens. It's just you drove your own path and you got there on your own. Sometimes I think that God is totally cool with allowing Satan to put obstacles in our way. That way we have to call on God to come in and move the obstacles out of our way so that he can provide a way. Okay, and this is what this verse means. It says that everything that's happened has helped it means that everything that has progressed the spreading of the good news. Okay, I was just thinking, I was holding uh, Nova Lee this morning. She started crying, but that's okay. I was holding little baby Nova Lee, and I, I was thinking about this, and I was like, this is the example of a way maker right here. This baby that shouldn't be here, and she's here. The Some of us, think about it this way. Some people shouldn't be alive right now in this room. Some of y'all did crazy things in high school that y'all probably shouldn't be alive from, but you're here. Some of you are like, Tom, some of you, you're like, I shouldn't be in church, that's for sure. Like, this is not the place where I belong, but somehow I'm here. How? God made a way. It's progress. You shouldn't be here, and God made a way. Okay, so that's what that means. Verse 13, these next verses are going to go a whole lot faster. For everyone here, everybody, y'all say everyone. Everyone. Including the whole, say whole. Whole. 
palace guard knows that I am in chains because of Christ. Everyone here, they know why I am here, okay? This verse doesn't say, I want to make this a point. This verse doesn't say that, that everyone here has became a follower of Jesus because I'm here in chains. That's not what it says. It says, everyone here knows why I'm in chains. It's not up to us to save people. It's up to us to be faithful and to share our testimony, to share the tests that we've gone through, to share the times that we've bit the bullet. It's up to us to share those things, but we can't save anybody. I can't save anybody. You can't save anybody, but we can share with people about Jesus who can save them. Okay? So this is what it's saying, is that people know why I'm here. People know why I'm in chains. And, and I, I wanted to think about this, okay? Husbands. Do your wives know why you follow Jesus? Do they know that you do? Does your wife know that you pray for them? Wives, do your husbands know that you follow Jesus? Parents, do your kids know why they're here on a Sunday morning? Or is it just, this is just what we do? We just go to church. Why are we here? We have to be very... Um, man, we have to make sure that we share with our families and the people that are around us that we are here at church because we're trying to learn more about Jesus. We're trying to grow closer to him, the people that we work with on, our, on a daily basis. We have to be very um, uh, intentional with sharing with people that this is what Jesus Christ is doing in my life, okay? This is what we're doing, okay? Uh, the, the Bible says in John 16, verse 8, it says, and when he comes, talking about the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of its sin and God's righteousness and of the judgment. Okay, so what this is saying is that the Holy Spirit will do the work of convicting. The Holy Spirit will do the work of, of bringing about righteous living. The Holy Spirit will do the judging. All we need to do is, is we need to share with people what we've been going through. Verse 14, and because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. This is called borrowed faith. Have y'all ever heard this, borrowed faith? Anybody? Okay. All right. Let me just make something very clear with borrowed faith. Somebody else's faith cannot save you. Okay. Can I just get a head nod if you believe that? Okay. Your parents' faith, mom and dad, y'all, y'all were amazing examples for me. We grew up in church, but your faith could not save me. Okay. Brittany, your faith cannot save our family, right? Your pastor cannot save you. You can't get into heaven because of my faith. But what my faith can do is I can allow for you to borrow some of my faith, to see some of my faith in action. You can see some of your parents' faith in action. You can see some of your friends' faith in action. And whenever we see their faith, we can borrow that faith, and it gives us faith to live out our, our life as a follower of Jesus. Okay? So this is what it looks like. We have borrowed faith. We see how people go through life after they get a diagnosis, the medical diagnosis, it doesn't look good. And we see that, man, it's like, what is the difference with that person? <coughs> how are they still so happy? We see the way that people forgive other people. And we're like, I would never forgive that person for doing that, but they forgave them. Okay. We look at the way that other people live and, and we get confidence to speak out. We go, okay, I didn't know that that was their testimony. I didn't know that they had gone through those things in their life when they were younger. But now that I know that they went through those things, now I can be a little bit more confident and I can share my faith. I can share my testimony. And this is verse 14. It's saying, because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence to boldly speak. They're, they're speaking more confidently. They're speaking boldly about the faith because Paul has been in chains and Paul has encouraged them. And now they have borrowed faith and they're boldly speaking God's message without fear. Verse 15, it's true. Some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry. Others preach about Christ with pure motives, okay? So there's two types of preachers right here. There's people who are doing it for the right reasons and people who are doing it for the wrong reasons. That's, every, that's everything in this world. Some people do it for the right reasons. Some people do it for the wrong reasons, okay? That's just how it is. And Paul's going, hey, listen, this is okay. There, there's, there's, there's two types of people, okay? Verse, verse 16, uh, they preach because they love me. They know I've been appointed to defend the good news. The others, they don't have pure motives when they preach about Christ. They preach for selfish ambition. Okay, so there's two different kinds of people. The, the great theologian of the 21st century, Taylor Swift, she said it perfect. She said that haters gonna hate. Right? That's, Lance, you're the one that gave me that. Don't shake your head at me. You know, T-Swift. 
T Swift. The Dixie Chicks? Yeah, she's the lead singer for the Dixie Chicks. <laughs> People are going to hate on you. People are going to hate on your testimony. People are going to hate on your past. Especially those of you who grew up in a town that you still live in. If it's a small town, people are going to hate on your past. People are going to hate on those things, right? They're going to hate on your family. They're going to hate on where you live. They're going to hate on your town, whatever. Paul says, listen, I don't care. Paul says, as, as long as Jesus Christ is being preached, if that's the case, then I rejoice. Should it surprise us, though, that Paul, a man who is willing and excited almost to be in prison, that he would be excited about Jesus Christ being preached, whether the motives are pure or not? It doesn't surprise me. This is what Paul says in verse 18. He says, it doesn't matter whether their motives are false or genuine. The message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Paul says, listen, I, I'll bite the bullet right here. I'll go through some pain. I'll go through some heartache. People are going to come to know Jesus because of this. I will rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. It reminded me of a verse and 1 Thessalonians, you know this verse, 1 Thess Thess Thessalonians for chapter 5, verse 16 through 18, very short verses, says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God uh, in Christ Jesus for you. This is God's will for you, right? Not that you live a life without any trouble. That's not God's will for your life, to live a life without any trouble. God's will for your life is not that you have a fat paycheck, God's will for your life isn't that your kid gets all the playing time. That's not God's will. God's will isn't that you're always going to have really good health. No, his will for your life is that you would rejoice always, that you would pray without ceasing, and that you would give thanks in all circumstances. And here's, here's what I do. Whenever all three of those things can't be checked in my life, I can kind of put the brakes on sharing my testimony. When I can't rejoice in all things, when I can't praise in all things, when I can't give thanks in all circumstances, and that's on me, right? That's not on God. That's on me. But I, I kind of put the brakes on that. Okay, but it's not about us. Look at your neighbor say, it's not about you. Some of y'all were a little bit excited to tell your neighbor that. <laughs> like, I'm just glad that I'm up here and Brittany's down there because she would have told me instead of Walter if that was the case. It's not about you, right? I mean, we love each other, but it, it's, it's not about us. It's not about how good we are. It's not about our accolades, right? It's not about how much money that we've given. This isn't what it's about. It's about Jesus. Colossians, Colossians chapter 1 verse 22 it says yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body God has reconciled us to himself through the physical body of his son Jesus who gave his life on the cross for us as a result he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault this is just saying that because of Jesus Christ's death on the cross he comes before you you, up here, okay? <laughs> you can stand before God holy and blameless. It's an amazing thing. Jude chapter 1, verse 24. It says present you, uh, to present you blameless before God. Jesus died on the cross so that we could be presented before God holy and blameless. That means to be without accusation. That way the devil can't bring accusations against us in our past and the things that we've done. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, okay? Paul, in Romans, he's talking to a church that have been told untrue things, and Paul's going, listen, your past can't hold you down anymore. So Paul says, in, in, in verse 18, he goes, I don't care how people are coming to know Jesus Christ. What I care about is that people are hearing that there is a Savior who died for them, who died on the cross, who shed his blood on the cross so that they could be forgiven for their sins, so that they would then have the opportunity to place their faith in Jesus Christ and when they place their faith in him, they surrender their life to Jesus and they live their life for him and they have a relationship with God forever and all eternity. That's what Paul's saying. This is what matters to me. I'll rejoice in all circumstances. And guys, this is where I am today with our church is that this would be my prayer just like Paul's. It's just to go, listen, I don't care how you come to know about Jesus Christ, but here's what I want you to know is that Jesus Christ does love you. Each and every person in this room, no matter how bad that you think you are, no matter how many bad things that you think that you've done, no matter how many unforgivable things that you think that you've done, you've committed against your wife, you've committed against your husband, you've committed against your family, against your children, at work, you know many, how many substances that you've taken, no matter any of those things that you've done, no matter how many images that you've looked at, that nothing can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ, that he died on a cross for each and every single person in this room. 
that he loves us in this room, every single one of us. And that he wants a relationship with every single person here. That happens only one way. That's by placing your faith in Jesus Christ, by surrendering your life to him. So this is my prayer. This is my, my hope is, is that you would surrender your life to Jesus Christ this morning. I'm just going to ask everybody, we do this all the time, nothing weird's about to happen, just that everybody would just close their eyes, have an opportunity to pray, have the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And if there's anybody that's in this room who's never asked Jesus Christ to come into their life, to be their Lord and their Savior, that means that you've actually surrendered your life to Him. Not that you prayed a prayer when you were a little kid and you didn't mean it, but that you've actually prayed a prayer to Jesus Christ. You said, Jesus Christ, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I give you control of my life. I surrender to you. I'm going to deny myself. I'm going to take up my cross. I'm going to follow you. I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you were fully dead. You went into the grave and you came back to life. You've now ascended to the right hand of the Father. This is, if you've never had that experience where you just believe that in faith that Jesus Christ died and came back to life and you've never surrendered your life and made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, man, today, I would pray is the day that you would do that. I just, I just think that it's so easy for Satan to confuse so many of us into thinking that we've done some really stupid things. And that we could never be loved by him. That, that Satan would, would try to make us think that because I did something this week, I could never be forgiven. I, that's, that's ludicrous to me. But I know that that's how Satan works. Because I, I guess I felt that way too. The Bible says in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and it's also crazy to me to think that people think that they can be good enough to get into heaven because of the things that they've done. They can look at their life. People think that the good in their life can outweigh the bad and that will get them into heaven. And that is true. That is a lie from Satan. Because it's not about what you've done. It's about what Jesus Christ has done. So maybe that brings a little clarity to a few things that you're dealing with. Maybe you think I'm good. I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. Uh, Unless you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that's not true according to the Bible. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And then also, again, Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Don't let Satan trick you into thinking you're a bad person, you're a messed up person, because we all are. Don't let Satan trick you into thinking you've, you've messed up with this over and over and over again, and you can't be forgiven, because you can be. Man, church, I pray that this is my prayer. <laughs> surrender your life to Jesus this morning. If you've never done that, heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed. you got people up here at the front who want to pray with you. I will drop this mic in a heartbeat if somebody comes up here and wants to pray to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We've got people off to the side, and we got men and women up here who are willing to pray with you. Maybe you're struggling with something and you're going through something, you're struggling with addiction, or maybe your kids are actually that crazy kid that I'm talking about in those hypothetical stories, or maybe you are going through financial struggles right now, or maybe your marriage is a wreck right now. I don't know what it is, but man, if you need somebody to pray with you, this is what church is for. Church is not about checking a box. You can go and come on up right now. Church is not about checking a box to say that we went on Sunday and then we're just going to try to make it until next week, man. Let the gospel message of Jesus change you this morning. So with that being said, Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll speak to us today. Change our life. Holy Spirit, move. We just give you freedom. This is your space anyways, but Holy Spirit, we just say that we would love for you to move and change our lives. Jesus, in your name I pray. Amen. If you'll stand up, we're going to sing a song. There's people up here who are willing and ready to pray with you this morning.
before we get into the, the blessing that we read over you and your family every single week, I'm going to take a quick opportunity to mention, and I'm going to say a catchy phrase so you'll remember when you walk out here, but um, uh, Josh has on his heart that, that the church should, should be a church of outreach. And so this is going to be Outreach October. So once a week, I'm going to talk to you all about an opportunity to where you can serve and you can represent the hands and the feet of the body of Christ outside of these walls. This this is a unique opportunity to serve uh, the food pantry. Next door, we house um, an operation uh, graciously um, that provides meals for uh, families that otherwise wouldn't have anything to eat every day, every single Monday. These family or these folks come up here and they're getting served, they're getting taken care of. And oh, third Monday, my bad. I'm already in three weeks from now on a different opportunity. So anyway, <laughs> uh, if you are interested in serving, uh, uh, representing just yourself, your family, represent Christ himself through that food pantry, please come and see me after this and I will get you pointed to the lady that's so graciously and desperately with arms wide open will receive you into that ministry, okay? All right. Um, I'm going to read the, the priestly blessing, and it's going to be out of Numbers chapter 6, starting at verse 22, okay? It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons to bless the people of Israel with this special blessing. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Whenever Aaron and his sons bless the people of Israel in my name, I myself will bless them. Church, I want you to have a great Sunday. I want you to bite the bullet, represent Christ well, die to yourself, and give Justin a birthday spanking. Keep it PG on the way out.